Hello everybody, it's Gary Vaynerchuk and this is episode three, 336? 26, I was thinking about it. 326 of the Ask Gary V Show. Uh, I'm super excited uh, to have uh, Tillman Pertita here with me. I'm gonna let him introduce himself. But we are taking questions on Facebook today. And so uh, let's just get right into it, Tillman. Thank you for being on. Hey, it's exciting to be here, Gary. Uh, everybody wants to come and be on the Gary V Show. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. So tell me, what, for, for the group that's watching right now or listening that doesn't know who you are, I'm a big fan of the origin story. So why don't you, why don't you tell everybody, A, what you currently, how you currently position yourself? Because one thing I adore about you from afar is you got your hands in a lot of different stuff. It's that kind of entrepreneurial mindset. I can attest to that, I understand it. Uh, so when somebody says, somebody meets, sits down with you and says, you know, and doesn't know who you are, they're like, what do you do? How do you answer it? Um, <laughs> that's really funny. That doesn't happen that often, but when it does, I just say, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to make a few dollars. I have a few <laughs> little businesses and, uh, you know, my main business is a company called Landry's. It's about 600 restaurants and Landry's owns everything from, from Mastro's to Martin's to Rainforest to Bubba Gump to Saltgrass to Ocean Air to Dos Caminos to Bill's Burgers and on and on and on. There's like 50 How many brands. Five zero. Five, yeah, about 50 brands and uh, over 500 restaurants. But And then the five Golden Nugget casinos are mine. And then uh, and aquariums, amusement parks, catch. Uh, and then uh, I have this little sports team called the Houston Rockets. And uh, I do that on the side when I'm not busy. Was, was, uh, <laughs> so let's take it all the way back. Where were you born? What kind of kid were you? I was born in Galveston, Texas. Uh, it's a BOI, and uh, I was I was never the smartest kid in the class. I can honestly tell you that. And uh, I can remember a teacher telling me once, you know, Mr. Fertitta, we know you have leadership abilities, but it, that's right. Keep right. I'm listening. We know you have leadership ability, Mr. Fertitta, but we wish you would lead in the right direction. Look at this. So. <laughs> I don't know how bad you were at school, but this is probably my pride and joy. My report card. It's pretty fucking ugly. It is a, uh, it is a, uh, it's a doozy. As you're getting your glasses, why don't I? Oh, there you go. No, no, so, I've, got, I've got to see these grades to see who was worse, me or you. Mm-hmm. This looks like one of mine in third grade. Uh, this, <laughs> this is my is high school. You know what? I, I, I am going to look at my, find, look I'm at my go, class rank. Look, I'm gonna, look down there, two forty all the way at the bottom, two forty three out of two fifty four. There were only 11 kids in my school that were worse than me. And there's no shot any of the 11 of them are alive. <laughs> so just to put into context. <laughs> that, that is so good. I just love this because I wasn't far behind. And, and, and that's what's amazing is I've, I've talked to entrepreneurs. Uh, we're given a different ability and, and it's, a, it's a God-given ability and yes. we just know how to do it. Yes. And uh, Knowing the, that you've been around sport, you know, do you view entrepreneurs like athletes that way? Like James Harden was given a gift. That's obvious to a lot of people. It's a little less obvious where you're going with this on the entrepreneurial kick, but I couldn't agree with you more. Gary, I talk about it all the time. I talk about it in this book that, that God gave us all an ability and he decided, Tillman, I'm not gonna make you a musician because I took guitar lessons for four years and I still <laughs> couldn't play a chord. I'm not gonna let you win a, 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 a Grammy. I'm not gonna let you win an Emmy. We're sure not gonna ever let you be an NBA all-star or be a professional athlete, but you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna give you a good little business brain where you know how to make money. And I realized that when I was in elementary school. I would carry my business around. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, uh, uh, I wouldn't read a comic book or do anything. I was selling candy and anything else I could buy and sell in junior high. In high school, I was already trading the stock market. Um, in, in college, I was, was, I was already family? booking bets. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Was the family, like what, what did your parents? My, my, my dad owned a seafood restaurant when I was growing up and was an entrepreneur. And there's lots of entrepreneurs in our Family, family genetic yep. pool on both sides. That's cool. And and uh, and so I definitely it's a gene. Okay? Yes, no it, question, w without a doubt. No and, question. And and uh, but I can remember my dad though. After I had my fifth restaurant, 
and I was making a couple of million dollars a year saying, why do you want to do any more? I mean, you're making you more it. money. You, you have made, made it. it. You have, I mean, you th- are by the living. Way, by the way, when I, I helped build my dad's one wine store into a national e-commerce player in the late 90s, and everybody in my high school and my friend group said I'd made it, and, and I remember like when they would say that to me at 28, 29, 30, and I left at 34, it was a family business, I built it from a three to a $60 million business, and then I left, started at zero, because it was my dad's business, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to give back to my dad, I was born in the Soviet Union, I was very proud and grateful for what my parents did for me, but at 29, 30, 31, my friends were like, you made it, right? Because they would read the articles, they would hear the numbers, and I used to laugh, I'm like, they don't even know that I'm about to restart from zero. T- totally. Made it. Like, totally. by the way, I feel like I haven't fucking started right now. I get up every day and it's kind of funny and I'm a little older than you and it's just sport. And it is uh, just sport. when I was 21, I won my first Cadillac selling Shackley vitamins. I, I said, when I'm 35, I'm going to buy my first jet. I did. And, uh, you know, on and Let on and on. Let me ask you a question. Have you thought about tangible things like were you that kind of like like for example it doesn't come natural to this day I don't want I want to buy the New York Jets so you've accomplished something I want to do right but I don't want anything else in between but were you somebody who wanted stuff like Cadillac Jets were like you were like you like that shit or you thought it meant something like I'm just curious how your brain worked no no totally I mean I had in my brain that this is what I want and I'm going to try to get from point A to point B however I have to do it and I hope you're not in the way because I'll have to run over your ass. Okay, yeah, I just, I <laughs> but but uh, but uh, I, I wanted the Cadillac. I wanted the the um, the. Can air, I ask you? The, can I ask you a deep question? Deep. Do you think you wanted that to show the people that thought you were not going to win that you were winning as an indicator? I think about this a lot. I don't have this great need to like show anybody. I actually, it's unbelievable to me how much I don't give a fuck if they know if I'm winning or not. I'm just obsessed with the process. However, there are many other things I have. I'm just always curious with ones that uh, go along the way, because we're all different in our nuances. I'm always fascinated by what did those things represent? Was it people, some people just like stuff. Like I'm fascinated by people who love a car or a jet. They understand it. They're like, it's got the horsepower. And I'm like, what the fuck, right? And then there's other people who need it to be like, I'm gonna fucking show Susan Thompson in third grade who didn't go to the dance with me that she fucked up. No, I think it was more of of the luxury and, and, uh, you know, how I wanted to live. I don't, yeah. I, I don't, I never had that mentor and I also never had that, I need to show you so. It was more in competitiveness with myself yep. and how I wanted to live. Yep. And, uh, you know, I'm proud that I've never gone through a TSA line, okay? And, and, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, and what's crazy about that, this is where, what I love about this shit, Tillman. And on the flip side, n- I put out so much content of me being at the airport. Like, I on the flip side love that I limit my private travel and we're doing the same thing. We're both putting something that we've subjectively decided is important on a pedestal. No, 100%. Yeah. It's interesting. interesting. Yeah, I mean, every day I'm like, I'm such a fucking idiot. Time is the only asset and I'm fucking putzing around on like fucking, you know, commercial, but then I'm like, fuck, so many people are watching. They get so much visuals around private and all this stuff. And like, I'm still comfortable I, like this. I like it. And it's a very interesting thing that I play ping pong in my head. No, because you know, even so many close friends of mine have, have always said to me, are you ever going to take me on one of your jets? I've known you for all these years. I don't do anything to show off. It is strictly, I believe you. this is the way I want to live. I believe you. Okay, it's all about how you want to live. What's the, what's, the, what's the weirdest thing? What's the least efficient thing you do that is around how you want to live. Like, what's something that's silly? Like, like I think me flying commercial is silly. It's not a good use of my time, but it's how I want to live, so I understand it. What is something funny that you do that doesn't make sense? Uh, probably, uh, you know, I loved being in Monte Carlo on my yacht, but going shopping in Zara and coming back to my boat and laying out to all of my crew. <laughs> That look what I look at all these jackets I just bought. How at, gorgeous they are for, for eighteen ninety nine euros each. That I had six gorgeous jackets that I only spent a hundred and thirty euros on, and I was so proud of myself. I couldn't wait to show my crew. That's what I'm proud of. I get is, it. Even though I like these nice things, I love to make a deal and 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 love to spend money on what I like. I'll spend money on the big things, 
that I watch how I spend it on the little things. I understand. I really do. <laughs> um, so how did your career go? Why, you know, you sold some stuff, you want a Cadillac, you're a good salesman, gift of gab, charisma, I get, you know, conviction, you know, right? Determination, I understand all that shit. Where, because your dad had a seafood restaurant, did you work in that seafood restaurant as a kid? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, learned learned, and learned, I learned craft. So I, I learned how the restaurant business works, yep. okay? Then you go to school, you get out, and uh, I got into the development business, was building homes, got into the video game business, the Pac-Man asteroids. Talk to me timed about that. that. I just timed it right. No, no, I, I, need, I don't know this. I don't know, I don't know a lot about anything, so that's why I love having these things. What did you do back, with that? Back, back I remember. In, back in the 80s, you had asteroids that came out, and it was the first real video uh-huh. game. And then be, be, then became Defender and Pac-Man and all of those. Well, I saw that the world was changing, and so I went out and bought these machines and started putting them in restaurants around, and all of a sudden, you're, you're, you know, I look up, and I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. Right, okay. you're, and are you and literally in, driving your Cadillac around, grabbing buckets of fucking quarters? No, but I was. I went out, you know, probably in the first. You know, I can't remember it, but eventually we had a few trucks of doing course. it. Of course, and all I remember but is I mean carrying the all these big bags of quarters, and you know, <laughs> and it was all I know is I was I was in high cotton. I was feeling really good about myself, and uh, did that for a few years, which gave me the opportunity to start building homes and little shopping centers and. Then I built my first hotel when I was 26 years old in my hometown, which I still own today. That's cool. And and uh, and that and that's kind of the story. And then the development business came apart. All the banks failed in in uh, the late 80s. This is a great story, and I talk about it in the book. I had loans at like nine different banks in the late 80s in Texas, and that's when this crisis was as bad as the 08, 09 yeah, crisis. Yeah, 87. The, the Black horrible. Friday was horrible. That, that was the the world came yeah. apart. Yep. Every bank that I did business with failed before I did. And so uh, this two million worth of loans, which was a bunch of money in the 80s, okay? Yeah, there was t- nobody me, to pay. Me- All of a sudden, you have to make a payment, and there's nobody to make a payment to. The bank is gone. The FDIC has shut them motherfuckers down. Okay? Tell, me, tell me real quick, because I want you to go back to the point. Please tell the kids here how much $2 million. Give me a number of the way you feel $2 million in 87. What's that equivalent to right now? I would probably say $20 million. You know, yeah. it'd be like having $20 million. You, and so right. I You gotta, know what I always talk you, about when, you know, I apologize. You know how I always tell my audience, I'm like, you know, my transcending moment in my career was when I was right about YouTube, but I didn't invest in it. <laughs> and then I read when YouTube sold for $1.7 billion to Google. I don't know if you remember this or anybody else in the room. That sounded like a trillion. It oh. was a step, now like companies that don't make any money are worth a billion, but at the time, YouTube, sell, this is only 2007, 1.7 billion? Well, it shook me. It, it, it's, a, it's a crazy number and, I'm, and I'll, I'll give you an example of something. So, so, so basically what happened is I got a reprieve from the governor, okay? And so all of a sudden I had five years to keep growing my business before the FDIC called me and said, uh, Mr. Fertitta, we have some loans here we would like to talk to you about. But by then, I had opened up a bunch of restaurants, made a bunch of money. I walked in and paid the FDIC $2 million. They waived all the interest, and they said, you were the only person to pay us in full. But I was rolling then, and so things were good. Do you want to wait till that thing goes? That, Keep that going. I'm fucking pumped. So, so, so <laughs> Keep going. You know what? So in 1982, I bought into the Rockets for $200,000. Is that we true? Paid two, I didn't know that. We paid $10 million for the Houston Rockets in 1982. Wait, you got 20% for $2 million? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm Just sorry. on the small percentage. Understood. Okay. One more time, because I didn't hear it. Was... $200,000. 20% would have been $2 million. I got it. So I think, but we also had some debt on it. I think I owned like 3 or 4%. Okay, whatever it was. Okay, so I'm a partner in the Rockets for 10 years. The owner decides to sell. The general partner says, this is becoming a billionaire's game. Well, this is in 1992, and I'm only worth about $10, $15 million. That's, don't get me wrong. That's a bunch of money. Okay. You're so I try to buy. I, I didn't have the ability to buy the team by myself. So I had a partner, and we tried to buy it. And I got outbid by a New Yorker, Les Alexander, he paid eighty million dollars for the team. So in ten years, the team went from being worth ten million to eighty million. Okay, now now here we go. Twenty five years later. Before you finish, I just want to remind people they've heard me say it a lot. The nineteen eighty two NBA Finals in America was on tape delay. 
it was it was the nothing. league was nothing it was nothing the it way was, you guys think about hockey right now this was below that and, and it's important i'll tell you why it's important and the reason i've jumped in twice now the 2 million 20 the league you and i have a similarity as i'm listening it's just arbitrage it's seeing things just enough time before somebody else but then having the conviction and the gumption to fucking do something 100 percent. so so think about this in 1992 i get outbid for 80 million okay 25 years later i don't get the team so i'm building my company so i build in that 25 years i grow my net worth from 10 million to almost 5 billion okay that's good the rockets go up for sale again 25 years later two i come in with the highest bid i was right there most ever paid for a sports franchise 2.2 billion so in 25 years the value of that team goes from 80 million to 2.2 billion and that's real dollars this isn't monopoly money okay you wire the money you pay for it so tell me were you a were you a big basketball fan uh this is this is so unbelievable i sit in the same seats today that I sat in for the last 25 years center court. I, I, I was one of the, this is so funny, after I bought the team, I'm one of the 30 longest season ticket holders of the Rockets. I love you. Isn't you, that amazing? And you not get only is it amazing, it's literally going to be how, I'm going to tell this story in 31 years. This is literally what, I, I'm going to clip this. You know how I clip old shit? I'm going to clip this and be like, I was sitting in this seat, now I'm here, and some new person, she's sitting in that seat. Like, I fucking understand. I would kill my children for the New York Jets. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I, and I, you know what? I would sell my children. I won't kill them for the Houston Texans or Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> you like both those teams? Uh, you oh, know, you want to own an NFL team? Is that I, what you're saying? I would saying? love to own an NFL team. That's, that's. Just a, take me back. Kid, as a super, got, as a young, young kid, who was your favorite team? Well, you know, what's kind of funny is, is was because. Because base, baseball was religion when you were a kid. When I, and I was the biggest Astros buddy there was. There was Astros all over. But but what happened was they used to have the you young guys don't know this but you used they to don't have know the black shit. that y'all don't know shit y'all, really yes. don't. <laughs> y'all don't know how bad we had it go okay? ahead get him, but tell you me. couldn't even watch the NFL team in Houston and you lived in Galveston because it was the fifty mile blackout rule. So you didn't get because they wanted you if, to come to the game. If, that's right. Because they, they didn't couldn't sell, sell out. They couldn't sell out. They blacked out, you out. Which and they didn't sell. That's out how back that's then. how the Raiders and Cowboys and Steelers became all people's fans because when they would black you out, they would show you one of those three teams. And so, in, because Dallas was uh, no, the right. because Dallas was the next closest team, and all of a sudden, remember this: when do you become a sports fan? Nine, ten years old. So I'm nine, ten years old. That's when the Cowboys start playing the Green Bay Packers and the Ice Bowls, and I'm watching them because the Houston Oilers aren't Tillman, on TV. As somebody who's in a market with two other basketball teams in the state of Texas, even though it's a big state, so I'm going to give you. I have an idea for you that I'm going to do when I buy the Jets. <laughs> when I buy the Jets, because I hate the Giants more than anything. Well, not more than the Patriots, but I hate the Giants, right? When I buy the Jets, my core marketing strategy to win the tri-state area is on every single person's sixth birthday, I'm gonna send them a Jets jersey and personalized messages. I think you should start sending six-year-olds jerseys in San Antonio and Dallas of rocket players. Why in the hell did you tell me this on air so I could have said (laughs) that I'm the smart motherfucker that came up with this? You know why? Let me be smart, please. This is the greatest strategy I came up with. Because I have good ideas and because I can't execute all of them, I put them out for free so that I can own the IP. Interesting. Right? Interesting, 100%. It's, right? right? Think about all the smart shit, like just getting a sense of you right now. By the way, I'm gonna say this publicly. Uh, I'm not joking. I don't usually, like I had no clue you owned that or how, like I don't know much about a lot of stuff. I just spend 100% of my time on the consumer. I just don't know a lot of stuff. I just know what customers are doing at all times. That's why I don't know much of other stuff. That takes a lot of time. So this gets booked through email. Uh, Matt put us together. But I know of you, of course. And over the last week, I've been with some fancy different people. You know, just like wheel, movers and shakers. I, the reason I was so excited to come in here today is I basically live my life for people to talk about me behind my back the way the four people that I spoke to in the last week about you talked about you. Interesting. That is interesting. Uh, uh, I don't know if it was good or bad. It was very good. 
It was very good. <laughs> no, it was very good because because what what is interesting is I'm always fascinated by people that actually know people versus knowing of them. Interesting. You know, my big game in life, there's plenty of people with the way I roll, the cursing, the bravado, the confidence, the conviction, especially if I'm putting pressure on your business, you're not gonna love me. But I care about what the people that actually know me say about me and in that group, a couple of them really know you and like, and are also very, very close to me so they're not gonna bullshit me. It's really cool. I, I like that. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. I like it. that. Anyway. And so keep going. Well, why'd you write the book? You know, it, it's really interesting. Uh, about 18 months ago, Harper Collins oh, my uh, publisher. called me and said, uh, hey, and we, we watch your television show, Billion Dollar Buyer. We, we, we see you on the, all the business shows, and you always had these Tillmanisms and these one-liners, and we've read all these articles about you, how you say, oh, I can see a burnout light bulb at one of my restaurants from 40,000 feet. And, and uh, they said, we'd like you to write a book. Well, I always thought somebody would say, we want you to write a life story book. And I said, I can't do that until I'm older because I'm still doing deals and I want to rip some people's ass, okay? Yep. So they said, no, we want you do to- Do you garage to... sale? Sir? Do you ever garage sale? Do you roll up on a garage sale and try to buy something for a dollar? Not in a- not That's in Zara a for you, right? Not, not a, Zara is my garage, garage sale. sale. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but did you? I, I've yeah, absolutely when I was younger. I apologize I mean, for interrupting, but you said rip somebody's ass, and I'm like, listen, like the the happy. I'll give you a story. I was at the National Sports Card Convention. I got to talk to you about basketball cards before we leave. Like, I see a humongous arbitrage in sports cards, and you need to go all in. I'm being dead serious. <laughs> I'm being dead serious with you, on the record. Uh, I was at the National Sports Card Convention in Chicago in in late July this year. I walked over to some guy's table, bought a Wayne Gretzky rookie card, not in great condition, for 220 bucks. I brought it back to my table, priced it at 260. An hour later, somebody came over and bought it for 260. I swear on everything, that $40 ARB meant more to me than all $50 trillion deals I make every day. Absolutely, because that's what we do. It's that's like me making do. the deal at Czar for all these yep. jackets on a closeout. That's why I asked okay. you about garage sales. So anyway, the reason you don't want to write a book is you still got a couple moves in you and you don't want to put it out there because the way, that's how you're going to fucking right. do it. But so they just wanted it in a silo and say, talk about how you made it. What, what, what were your philosophies, all your Tillmanisms and, you know, the 95-5 rule, there What's are no that? spare, you know. 95% of everything we do is right every day in business. But look for the 5% you do wrong and that's what makes you better than everybody else. There are no spare customers, okay? It's a competitive Facts. world in every one of our businesses. Take no out of your damn vocabulary. You, you're, you're on a business trip and it's 11.02, you hang up the phone and, and uh, on a call and you call down to order some breakfast and they say, I'm sorry, sir, uh, we don't serve breakfast anymore. I say, that's okay, no problem. I don't need a waffle or, or an eggs benedict. Just throw a couple of eggs in a skillet and send them up scrambled, however it's easy for you to do. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, we don't serve breakfast. Why are you telling me no? I didn't ask you Preaching. for anything special. Preaching. You're gonna throw a burger in the pan, just throw me a couple of eggs and take care of me. B, you're in the hospitality business, okay? And you're telling me no. And everybody's in the hospitality business no matter what they do. You take care of your customer, okay? You take care of your customer. It's no different than we walk in and your people meet us polite. You put a welcome up on the screen. You come in here, everybody couldn't be, can I get you some water? Tell me, can, can I do this for you? You're in the service business. Everybody so why is. do you want to be an ass and, and say no to somebody when it's just as easy to say yes or you Tell just them, give an alternative? Because the company's being run by somebody who's not. Because these companies get big and they hire somebody who fucking went to Harvard and fucking worked at Bain and McKinsey and they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. That's why Tillman. I love my McKinsey consultants when I see them. I just love them. I, I, it's so funny you said that because <laughs> I have in this book, consultants will consult your ass right out of business. 100%. Okay. And I don't hire I consultants. You know why? Because they've never fucking done anything. The, the, uh, unless I need I need a report or that's something, like me telling, and I tell them what I want them to say. That's like me that's telling when I Russell walk Westbrook in. what the fucking do. One hundred percent stupid. <laughs> I watch a lot of basketball. I've got ideas. It's fucking stupid. Because you know what you know and what you don't know. It it's unbelievable. The de it's why I love athletes. When you really get to know them, it's really fascinating how they talk about fans. They've got whatever variable, no matter how you take it, pro and con. What I, if, you, if you melt every athlete, what they really say when they talk about fans is they just don't know. 
Whether they say they're assholes or whether they love them, they just understand that they have no fucking idea. They have no context. It's actually my favorite thing that's going on in Earth right now. We live in a judgment society. Because of social and everybody has a voice and because the way, we've always been judgmental. That's how humans are. Small little town, somebody said, oh, Ruth's borscht is not as good. Like, we've always been judgmental, <laughs> right? But, but now we can see the physical manifestation of it. But the reality is people are judging people left and right without knowing anything about the truth. Nobody knows you. Nobody. Nobody. And that's why when, when, when I have a good friend that'll say to me, you know, I was over here and I was at a bar and they were trashing your ass. And I'll say to him, well, do you know Tillman Fertitta? Uh, no, but that's what I heard. You know, because people don't like people on top, okay? And, and, and you're on top, I'm on top. And, and, and I do think people, though, are, are getting a little nicer, though. I think people now seem well, to listen, we have respect you listen, or whatever. We have macro anxiety in the ecosystem, and eventually that becomes tiring, and people go, like, the world just ebbs and flows. It's not super complicated, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Tell me, so what, what was the breakthrough? So I like the story, because I want to go back, because I like learning from storytelling, and you're doing a great job at it. You don't have to pay back for an extra five. That gives you ammo. What was the, you have all these great brands, so I'm really excited to dig in here a little bit because by the way, my entire company, which we're a global marketing company, a thousand people, big business, it's all a front. I'm building all this infrastructure to do what you and I do at scale, which is when the economy collapses, I'm gonna buy historic brands and refurbish them. And that's what I do. And I was the first person out there to, to start a platform and saying, um, like, let me give you an example. So I go public in 1993. With, with what? With, with 10 restaurants. Landry, Which ones? Landry Seafood yep. House. I'm making six million a year in EBITDA and all of a sudden you wake up and you're on the NASDAQ and you're worth a hundred million dollars. Right. So over the next few years, I build restaurants and then I, I re then we hit a dip in, in, in the late nineties. The Why? tech dip, the tech dip. Okay. You mean the but market? The market did. And so all and of so a sudden. your sudd stock price went down. Yes. I understand. But at the same time. Was I your had, business healthy though? Just my business was healthy. And you know this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What your stock does and the health. Has healthy, nothing to have do. Have nothing, nothing to do with each other. You know, like, oh, Cisco missed their numbers. This Tell me, wait a minute. This is actually completely confusing to me. You were a public CEO? Yes, for how 18 the, years. How the fuck did you deal with that shit? Because I performed and. You I told always, them to go fucking and, themselves? No, and. You had to a little bit. You're, right? You had to tell these people on the earning call who would like try to ticky tack you on some bullshit. And the, you're the playing. The longer I got and the richer I got, I put up with less. Okay, but I, okay. I can remember. But you got to. But, but you got. Leverage under, is a funny thing. No, but but it's it's interesting because. And why I you had a board, you I had a board that like was all in on you? Let me let me please. First off, uh, it, when I took it public, I owned a hundred percent. Okay. Okay. That's uh, an easy way to start. So so it was my board. It was, it was you. It was my, I had a board, but it was my board. It was okay. you. And, and, uh, and if you keep over 50%, you only have to have an outside audit committee. You don't even have to have an outside board. So you don't have to have a compensation committee and all that. I understand. Okay. So, so I basically controlled the company for many, many years, but I grew it from a $30 million company to when I took it private, being an opportunist, you know, X amount of years later to a multi-billion dollar company. But, but uh, we, we, we got off track somewhere, but what happened is- Don't worry, it's I, not I realized, time no, but I realized, I realized that I could go buy somebody and get rid of their GNA and bring them to Houston and keep the store operations, but not have all that overhead. And so over that the next- the arbitrage. Because over the next 20 years, what I did was, and I can tell you every city that I shut down somebody from Portland, McCormick and Schmick to, to Chicago, uh, Chart House's home offices were there and Martin's home offices were there in, in uh, Laguna Beach. It was Bubba Gump and Claim Jumper. And I can just go from city to city. Minneapolis, it was Ocean Air and Rainforest. So I bought all these companies and I just shut their office down and consolidate in, in, in Houston and save millions and millions and millions on GNA. And And so I built this platform and I bought all these companies right and, and re rejuvenated them if they needed it. Some of them weren't even screwed up. They were just screwed up public companies, but they were, I bought Rainforest for $75 million and it was making 30 million a year and had 15 million in the bank, but, but their stock had fallen because their growth slowed down. But it was a great company to buy. And back then everybody else was scared. Private equity hadn't gotten into consumer businesses yet. And people that are strategics wouldn't buy them because, well, I'm a CEO. They might fire my ass if I screw uh -huh. up. Well, I said, fuck this. I'll go buy the world. 
and took my net worth from a few hundred million to billions. Yep. Then what happened? Buying stuff. Better keep going, motherfucker. (laughs) Okay. So you built that up. You built that up. You built that up. And 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 then in 10, well, a lot of them happened after 10. Okay. But in 08 and 09, when the crisis and every stock went down, I went back and bought 100% of my company again. Yep. And today. uh, Because you were liquid enough? I was liquid enough and knew yeah. how to financially engineer it. That's it. And and uh, today, it's probably truly the single largest one shareholder company in America. You know, everybody's got a one percent partner or this or that. It is one hundred percent me and my family and and Good uh, for you. four billion in revenue, awesome. seven hundred million in EBITDA. It's fucking amazing. So it's been a good ride. Have you been paying attention? Have you been paying? The- so you're still actively running it. Fuck yeah. Who so else have, is going to run well, it? Well, I don't know. I mean, you said eight. Yeah. Oh, you said yes, 18 years. You took it private. Yeah. Which is and then I'm still Listen, running. I don't know shit about you. Obviously I mean, not. I know you're well, fucking. You better go read my fucking book. I don't book. read shit. <laughs> Did you look at my fucking report card? <laughs> Tillman, talk to me about this. Are you paying attention to the disruption, that potential disruption? This is something that's probably on your radar, especially the video game, by the way. At some point, we'll have dinner. I can feel it already, and I really, really need you to tell me the war stories about the video game I will thing. Because I all fuck, waters in my pocket. I, I love that shit. <laughs> but are you paying attention to these, you know, virtual kitchens? Are you? Because I'm very fat. You know, this is early for me. You're much deeper expertise. But I think fast casual and QSR have a looming potential concern very similar to the way I felt about retail 10 years ago around these virtual kitchens and people building brands on top of that infrastructure and actually just being marketing companies and doing last mile delivery at scale in a decade. Is this on your mind? I I see all of it and I think about all of it, but food to me is still a personal thing and I I just don't think you're personal as in you'll go somewhere no yes and how you eat it and who prepared it or whatever so i don't know that the the virtual kitchen is it is it going to ever work so you're saying from you know maybe from a fast food drive-in infrastructure that will disrupt it because that's a mobile play but things that go a little bit higher up where you're actually going to people it. are going to always like it if you can if it helps you quicker you know technology yeah. speed, makes wins. It spit, speed, speed wins speed wins okay but i still think that you still want to touch and feel at the same time touch it'll be and, interesting hold on let's keep playing this because i'm fascinated by your take touch and feel as in like i have to Talking go to, to the place go to the place that i talk believe about it that i believe and and but and, i think on the delivery sh- front it, there's, it's going to be an, a fascinating debate. There is a there is a delivery issue though, and this is the problem. You've got all the home delivery companies. They're all underwater. The, they're all underwater. All I invested in one, yeah, and, and I'm underwater. Okay. Yeah. Matter of fact, I'm underwater. drowning. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you fucking drowned. No, drown. no, no. You I, fucking. You're no, actually I dead. wasn't drown. I drowned. Yeah, you're dead. <laughs> we went to the funeral. It was amazing. Okay, but because the, the problem is, is that. It's expensive because of labor costs today and fuel costs and everything else. And then the delivery companies want a 20% discount at least or a little more, a little less. The restaurants don't make any money then because that's our margin. Yep. Okay, so they're not happy. We're not happy. So I really don't know where it's going if you want to know the truth. That I agree with because that infrastructure, does. the drivers aren't winning, the restaurants aren't winning, the platforms are not winning. That's dead. I think that the next step that's being built quietly right now, which is the infrastructure to make the food at scale within a mile, one mile radius of an enormous percentage of our society is gonna be a totally different game. I will totally, once again, we all come up with great ideas yeah, yeah. and this is gonna work. Yeah. Blue Apron, people are gonna never go out to dinner again. They're gonna Let me ask this. this. Let me ask you this. Do you, be- this is just a fun thing because you know, in 10 years we'll watch this video and we'll, we'll get a kick because the, by the way, what I know about you, because I'm listening for sure, is 99% of people don't play the way we play because they're scared to lose. No fear. I, I love no losing. Fear. And I mean it. I actually mean it. I, I Because that means I fucked up. I deserve it. I deserve it. I never blame anything else. I did some, something, I did something wrong. Full fucking accountability. Nonetheless, do you believe, I be, let me rephrase it. Do you agree with this statement? Because I think you may not, which is amazing. I believe that in a decade, there will be a restaurant that looks like Shake Shack, that looks like, you know, uh, Chick-fil-A, that looks like Fast, 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 or QSR, that actually has no locations, but is a billion dollar enterprise in sales, 
of their product on the framework of these kitchens at scale around the world? True or false? Possibly could happen. That's Poss- not an answer. True or false? We're gonna- we're False. Gonna, awesome. Now we have a fun dinner in 10 years. No, because- Now we have a fun dinner. No, because I've even- That's okay. I have so many brands- I know I gotta go, I know I gotta go. I have so many brands in Houston, I've thought about building just one kitchen and let it. everything go out of there. I get it. Okay, but then your, your delivery pie is only gonna be so big. Yeah, unless you hit infrastructure at scale. Listen, I gotta run because I have a public appearance, but I'm fucking pissed because we haven't even started. So we need to hack this. You, you're, how often are you in Houston? Always? Half the time? No, no, I have a place here in New York also. I'm, I'm up here we at need least to part, once a month. Are you willing to do part two with me on this? Absolutely, right. absolutely. When's the book, is the book out? The book came out yesterday. Awesome. You ordered on Every Amazon. Every single or, person that's watching, buy this book. Shut up and listen. Shut up and listen. <laughs> and, and what's better than, you get that more than anybody, right, Gary? You know what's, you know what's funny? No, because, because, meaning, I get it from people saying no, that. No, 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 you, no, no, no. Oh, you I understand get it that because you want people to listen because you know you have something you know to say. You know what's funny, Tillman? I'm, I'll be very frank with you. I, this is interesting to me. Mine would be like, you know what my title would be like? Hey, I hope you listen because if you actually do something with what I'm saying, something good might happen. You know, that's to good. me, I what? That's a long ass. That's a long ass title. But that's my. You know what's funny? Say that you know what's funny? For all the things he that was I'm not, dyslexic. You know. He, <laughs> You know, for all for all the things for all the things Tillman that I think have gone well, what have you? There's an interesting. You you really won me over on the eggs at 11:04. For some weird reason, no matter what I accomplish and I fucking plan on accomplishing, there's something about the consumer that I just respect so uncomfortably more than what I want for myself that it makes me go there. Right? I don't even. I don't feel all my accomplishments or all the predictions and invest all the things I've been right about still to this day I think I have to earn a hey please consider I you know which is what and I love where you went with it I know where you went with it but my big thing actually my big thing is the prayer that they do something with it Tillman do you know many people are watching or listening to this right now who've come across you over the last 30 to 40 years who had the luxury of being in a meeting or dinner with you where you said something smart they built on top of it they knew what to do, but they didn't do anything about it? No, but I, people tell me, I, I, I know this I've had to learn is, we're just talking words, but people listen. Yeah, listen, that I understand. What I'm talking about is the amount of, th- for example, I'm gonna tell you right now that you should buy a shitload of Wilt Chamberlain, Oscar Robinson, that the legends of the NBA are on the beginning phases of being similar to the Marvel Universe and some of the most iconic 60s and 70s and even early 80s superstars rookie cards are about to 10X. I know that to be true. Okay, don't tell everybody that's <laughs> listening to us, Gary. I tell mean, me, you uh, wanna know the best part of why I keep doing this? Nobody takes fucking action. <laughs> well, I will take some action. Yes, sir. All right, y'all cancel my next right. meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Come see a basketball game with me. And you- it's-